This program is brought to you by Emory University. I know that when you look at your program schedule, you say, where's Professor Vanderviver and this is Zwier. What do we got Zwier up here for? Um, I uh, have had some experience with the International Criminal Court and I was delighted to be and to see these rock stars on this panel and I kind of intruded myself into uh, the discussion and said, well, move over because I want to be part of the, the discussion. So that's why you see Zwier up here is that I've in some ways forced myself in. I wanted to say also last night I had a chance to work with or meet Julian Nichols. Julian is, um, I, I'm so proud to say, an Emory alum, and I don't know if we could give him another round of applause with our small group here, but um, it's just inspiring to me that, inspired by Professor Vanderviver, and he also told me, he said, and here's where I'm, uh, you, you can see my angle here. He said, the Emory Trial Techniques Program was invaluable. Uh, he said that he felt like he came out of our program uh, in part, right, prepared by that, and it gave him a chance to hit the ground running in this new court environment and have an idea of how to put a case together and to think about putting a case together. So um, I was patting myself on the back, uh, Julian, to say, yes, we're carrying on that tradition, and I hope you all feel like there's a piece of the Emory education that will help empower you to think about doing this kind of work. It also struck me as we move into this panel uh, how it is that what Julian's describing, uh, he, he mentioned this bridge between the difficulties he had to put together the case in the ITCY, how that affects the Thomas Labunga case, case. And I, he and I were talking last night. Let me just give you this little insight. He has some experience with what the investigators have had to do to put the case together. Um, against Lubunga, and it turns out, as you'll know, when we hear about this case, that the investigators who went there often were scared to death because they were in environments where uh, there were folks that could take them out. And so to get cooperation and to get evidence, you can imagine, just as, as uh, uh, Julian was talking about it, was extremely dangerous. And We'll hear about this, but one of the issues in the Labonga case is promises that had to be made to the investigators to keep their information confidential, and then that put it in crossways with obligations to turn over evidence to the defense, because some of the uh, information they got was exculpatory in nature, and so there, the court was faced with a really difficult situation, and maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that as we go through this panel but um, found that to be a really interesting and important insight about the difficulties of going to uh, um, the Congo to try to investigate cases like this. So let me tell you about these rock stars here uh, to my right and introduce to you, first of all, and give you a little brief idea of who each one of these folks are and what they're going to talk about. Noah Weisberg, Noah Weisberg is worked very close with Marino Campo. You need to know that he was on the inside of decisions that are made about whether to issue arrest warrants for various people, including Omar Bashir and these folks, and what was the decision that was behind that and how that all worked out. And, and I'm sure he's going to focus on the Labanga uh, case, but maybe we can also get him to talk a little bit about some of those decision-making uh, procedures. And so he's going to give us an overview of the Lubanga case. He's going to give us a factual description of what's going on and raise some issues for us. Um, and then the, the rock star immediately to my right, Diane Marie Mon, uh, is, is um, one of these Woodruff professors, but at uh, UGA, at the University of Georgia Law School. Talk about a star. Um, look at her bio at some point, what, 48 publications, um, and also deeply involved in individual experiences with the International Criminal Court. She serves as a special advisor on uh, 
on uh, children uh, in armed conflict, and so we will get an insight into how it is to work as a scholar and a researcher in this really tough area about child soldiers and conscription of child soldiers. And so Diana is going to make some comments about and, and give us an insight as to how that worked out in the Thomas Labanga case and what issues are really raised from that case going forward. In addition, we have in the middle here Charles Jallo. Um, uh, Charles is another rock star in the sense that he has the real deal experience working with the Inter International Criminal Court. He was telling us last night that one of the things that he did quite briefly was he was appointed to be defense counsel for Charles Taylor. This is a guy that's worked at the court, worked in the court, worked right at the cutting edge. And so we are really, I think, uh, going to be um, at the, at the seat of what was going on, the decision making that's going on, Charles has that experience. He is now, he told me, he's just freed up now as an academic to be able to comment on some of these things. Of course, he's still got client confidences and so we can't violate those, but he's got an ability to comment on the court and comment on what was going on and obviously will give us some insights into some of the recent attacks um, on the International Criminal Court as perhaps being too focused on Africa and uh, what, what response he sees from those attacks as to the future of the court and what the court um, needs to, to be worry, working about and worried about as it's thinking about uh, this question of is the International Criminal Court an uh, international tribunal or is it overly focused on Africa. So, Noah, tell us about the Lebanon case. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Bethany, and thanks to the journal for inviting me to participate. This is my first time in Atlanta and at Emory, uh, and I'm honored that you've included me. I suppose that my contribution today should be to set the scene a little bit for the Lubanga trial and to tell you a little bit about um, the Second Congo War. Lubanga's crimes were committed in the context of the most deadly war since World War II. Um, the Second Congo War, which took place between 1999 and 2003, and is still kind of trickling on, uh, resulted in the death of over 5.4 uh, million people. It involved around 20 armed groups and 10 national armies who were warring for control over lucrative mines and trade routes in the Ituri region uh, of the Congo. Thomas Lubanga was the first person to be tried at the International Criminal Court. He was the commander-in-chief of a militia called the um, uh, Ugandan, um, sorry, called the um, Union of Congolese Patriots, which was backed by Uganda, and later uh, Lubanga and his group changed alliances and shifted into the Rwandese sphere. This was an ethnic militia of the Hema tribe and was at war with Lendu tribes in the Ituri province. During the war, Lubanga became one of the most notorious warlords in the region. Human Rights Watch accused his group of ethnic massacres, murder, torture, rape, and mutilation, as well as the recruitment of child soldiers. The UPC was composed predominantly uh, of child soldiers, but his group wasn't the only group uh, that included child soldiers. And I think Diane is going to talk a little bit more about the implications of these uh, crimes and the charges. And I think she may also speak about another child soldier's case related to the, Uban the Lubanga case as well. Lubanga was arrested uh, after he was forced out uh, of Bunya by the Ugandan army in March 2003. He ended up in Kinshasa and registered his political uh, party uh, as a legitimate political group. He was arrested in 2005 in connection with the killing of nine Bangladeshi peacekeepers. The Office of the Prosecutor negotiated with the Congolese and on the verge of Lubanga being released, decided to proceed with the case against him. And that's how the case became the ICC's first uh, case. The prosecutor charged Lubanga with the conscription or enlistment of children under the age of 15 years into the armed forces or groups or using them to participate actively in hostilities. This is a war crime. 
One of the big questions was, were these charges too narrow? Lubanga and his group had committed all sorts of terrible crimes, including ethnic massacres, and some of these child soldiers were subjected to brutal conditions. Uh, many uh, uh, had been uh, abused, uh, um, and uh, there was a lot of sexual violence against the women, uh, the child soldiers that were female. One of the difficult things to prove at the trial was how old these children were. So as a result, the trial was composed, was built on oral testimony of witnesses. And this is one of the reasons that it took so long and involved so many difficulties. So the case was really long. It took six years, and the decision ended up being over 600 pages. One of the reasons, another reason why the, the case and the decision were so long was that there was a number of due process challenges. For example, the prosecutor was required to uh, disclose exculpating evidence to the defense. But he had made confidentiality agreements, predominantly with the United Nations, who had agreed to hand over information to him to build and get other more direct information. And then when he was asked to disclose this information by the court, the prosecutor said he could not because of confidentiality agreements that had been made. Another issue um, that created due process issues was the use of intermediaries from local NGOs to keep in touch with the witnesses. The prosecutor used this strategy of using intermediaries in order to protect these witnesses and to facilitate uh, a kind of keeping in touch with them throughout the six years of the trial. Judges, though, uh, decided that a number of these witnesses, a number of these intermediaries, were pressuring the witnesses to change their stories in certain ways. So three of the witnesses, the intermediaries, that were connected with witnesses were um, uh, rejected by the court, and all of the evidence that had been related to them uh, was rejected as well. The judges rejected, however, a stay of proceedings uh, that was raised by the defense. The defense said that the entire case was unstable because of these intermediaries and the prosecutor's decision that he wasn't going to release uh, this confidential information to the defense. The judges opted to reject it, uh, but explained, as a result, every factual finding uh, in minute detail in order to uh, have a solid foundation for the verdict in the end. Another reason why the case was so long was that the victims had a special role in participating in it. One of the innovations of the ICC is that the victims can participate directly. They can have their own counsel. Um, they can introduce evidence. They can question witnesses. They can challenge the relevance and admissibility uh, um, of evidence. They can advance written and oral submissions through their legal representatives. And there was 129 victims participating in this case. The victims also challenged the narrow charges, the conscription and enlistment of child soldiers, and tried to have extra charges added, including uh, these gender-based uh, um, charges that were not added in the original um, indictment. So there was this huge debate whether the trial uh, chamber, partway through the case, could uh, modify uh, and change kind of the characterization of the crime. So the victims applied to have the facts in the case legally recharacterized to include inhumane treatment and sexual slavery. The trial chamber issued a decision giving notice to the parties that the legal characterization of the facts might change. And that was where the prosecutor and the defense appealed. So there was kind of this interlocutory appeal, and the, uh, the appeals chamber decided that um, uh, this would not go ahead. The charges were not included originally, and therefore it would not be good for the trial process to add them halfway in. Ultimately, the trial chamber admonished the prosecutor for advancing extensive submissions regarding sexual violence, then, expo then opposing its inclusion in the charges, then at sentencing, suggesting that sexual violence be included again. So these were some of the irregularities and the controversies surrounding the trial. I think, however, that the largest question, the most important question that the first trial of the ICC raises, 
is the question of uh, what kind of justice do we want? Do we want justice that's narrow, like Hannah Arendt proposed in Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she said, not only does the Eichmann court not have at its disposal the tools required for the investigation of general questions, it speaks with an authority whose very weight depends upon its limitation. Or do we want something broader, something larger, a concept of justice that includes restorative elements, historical elements, where the charges reflect the truth of the victims, and create a historical record for future generations? This is a question that's going to be raised, I think, by another panel, about the question between retributive and restorative justice later. My position on this is that justice has evolved since the time of Arendt writing Eichmann in Jerusalem, and that now we have a broader notion of what justice entails. The International Criminal Court builds certain new procedures uh, um, uh, into the process, including the participation of victims, and I think that this needs to be taken into, into account. The judgments should be shorter. The prosecutor and the judges need to be more disciplined in the way they bring about um, their historical record, but I do think that the charges should be broader. And I think that the court will get better at doing this, like the ICTY has become better and more efficient over time. It's going to be a challenge to have wider charges and a broader notion of justice, but I certainly think that it's possible. So I think I'll pass it on next to my co-panelists. Thank you so much, Noah. Is this working? Yeah? OK. Um, what I'd like to talk about now that we have an overview of the Lubanga verdict is the role of children in this particular trial and more generally in the work of the International Criminal Court, um, both in its present form and looking somewhat historically to how the importance of children uh, has developed in recent years. As Paul mentioned, um, on an auspicious date, 12-12-12, December 12th of 2012, uh, the current International Criminal C Court prosecutor, Fatou Ben Souda, uh, gave me the honor of appointment as her special advisor on children in and affected by armed conflict. I am going to talk about issues within my mandate, but I do want to stress that I'm not in any way representing uh, any views of the court. These are my own thoughts at this point about these issues. That appointment, however, came in between two very important judgments. The judgment on March 14th of 2012 in the Lubanga, the Lubanga case, about which Noah has just outlined for us, and the judgment just six days later on December 18th of 2012 in the Ungojolo case, another case arising out of the same province in the same country, also charging child soldiering. That points to a remarkable fact. The first two trials of the International Criminal Court, the only two trials to have gone to judgment in its first 10 years, focused uh, in one case exclusively, in the other case quite, uh, quite prominently, on the uh, crime of enlisting, conscripting, or using uh, to participate in the hostilities children under the age of 15. Why is that remarkable? Well, I think if you look at the period during which international criminal justice was revived, was founded, depending on your historical perspective, i.e. the Nuremberg era, you'll discover that the word children does not appear in the Nuremberg Charter, notwithstanding well-documented at the time atrocities against children and uh, great knowledge about children as victims as well as combatants during World War II. The UN Charter of 1945 also does not contain the word children or child in it, notwithstanding it's the founding document for uh, 
interna international institutions in the last 60 years, just as Nuremberg in many ways is the fountainhead for not only international criminal law, but international human rights in the modern period. Contrast that with the Rome Statute of 1998, which contains many mentions of child or children in its document. The very first words of the preamble state that the drafters are mindful of offenses against children and the threats to future generations created by the atrocities uh, that the court is charged with punishing. The statute explicitly authorizes the prosecutor to appoint experts with special expertise, advisors with special expertise, and it specifically mentions among uh, the very few areas that it defines violence against children, so that the drafters had this well in mind in 1998. More specifically, the enumeration of offenses punishable by the court includes three that explicitly deal with children. Borrowing from the 1948 Genocide Convention, um, it is one of five acts that can amount to genocide if other elements are met to forcibly transfer children from one population to another. It is one of 11 acts that can constitute a crime against humanity, again, if other elements are met, to engage in enslavement, a term that is specifically defined to include trafficking of children. It is, finally, a war crime in non-international armed conflict, i.e. civil war, or in international country versus country conflicts to conscript, enlist, or use children under 15 in hostilities. It's that last war crime the recruitment and use of children in hostilities uh, during a civil war that was charged and prosecuted in both Lubanga and Ungujolo. Both men were militia leaders, albeit of different uh, ethnic militias, militias of different ethnic identity. Both also were charged under a form of liability defined in the statute as commission of a crime by an individual jointly with another or through another, regardless of whether the other person committed a crime. It's a form of accomplice liability, not unusual, I think, to American practitioners, the phrasing perhaps, but not the concept. It has come to uh, be given what I think many would say right now is the unfortunate label of indirect co-perpetration. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. In both cases, as Noah said, eyewitness testimony, particularly witnesses who got on the stand and said, either I was a member of the militia and I saw children being forced to fight, forced to join, or witnesses who said, I was a child and I was forced to fight. I was kidnapped into the militia. I was raped by the commander when I was put in this camp. In both cases, the eyewitness testimony of all of those witnesses was rejected by the trial chamber in its entirety. That's extraordinary. So what you ended up with in both trials was a, what was left of the case was hearsay testimony from, for instance, a, a UN a member of the UN mission in the Congo who said, uh, this is what I heard when former child soldiers started streaming into our facilities for disarmament. Um, Secondhand testimony of that nature, often anonymous, everybody knew testimony. Those of you who have taken evidence knows that the every, everybody knew testimony is very problematic, particularly in the United States, as well as circumstantial evidence that I suspect would not have been as problematic in the US. Some documents and apparently militia leaders um, like to go on videotape. And so videotapes that were preserved of the militia leaders um, in action. What's the result? Well, in Lubanga, the result, notwithstanding the rejection of all eyewitness testimony 
and a remainder, a residual of some physical evidence and some circumstantial evidence, the result was conviction. However, in Ungujolo, a case that, uh, a judgment that to this date is only available in French, and given that the Lubanga judgment has not yet been rendered into French, probably will remain only in French for quite a while, in Ungujolo, he was acquitted. Why the difference? Well, I'd like very quickly to talk about it, but to tell you to do it very quickly is doing great injustice. Noah mentioned that the judgments could be um, shorter. You probably see this binder and think it's my entire file on this paper. This binder is the Lubanga judgment. It is almost 600 pages. The sentencing decision is another 100 pages. The reparations decision is another, I think, 75 pages. And frankly, you can't understand any of them and you go, unless you go back to the 100 plus page decision on confirmation of charges. So bear with me if I distort in the interests of time. What's the difference? In Lubanga, the video uh, was damning and I would submit that perhaps it could have been a one-day trial uh, with authentication of the video, playing of the video, and the resting of the prosecutor's case. Why? He uh, is giving a pep talk, a speech at a training camp of his militia, urging everyone present at the video to um, fight to the death, et cetera, et cetera, all the usual things you might expect to hear. And he does it while he's surrounded by a phalanx of boys carrying guns, wearing the uniform of the militia, whom the, the trial chamber, by watching the video, determines must have been under the age of 15. That's the case, in a nutshell. Why didn't the video in Ungojolo go to the same effect? It was after the fact. So I think another lesson that comes away, in Lubanga, as Noah mentioned, the charges span months, almost a year between 2002 and 2003. And so there's a course of conduct that's being charged. The video isn't, even if it's undated, it's known to be within this period and it's evidence of ongoing conduct. In Ngojolo, the prosecutor, for reasons I do not know, chose only to charge one massacre on one day in one village. And the videotape that they found of Mr. Ungojolo in uniform, boasting that he was the commander in chief of the militia and responsible for everything that happened, post dates that attack. Not by much, by a week or two. But I think in the absence of any direct testimony, reliable, credited testimony, that on the day he was the commander and responsible. The trial chamber simply wasn't going to make what otherwise would be a perfectly reasonable inference that if on, let's say, March 10th, he was the commander in chief in uniform, he probably was on February 24th as well. I think that it was the absence of that kind of evidence that created it. That surely underscores one of the things that Mr. Nichols just talked about, the importance of investigation. That there is a great difficulty, I think, for the prosecutor's office in particular to investigate, and perhaps even more important, to corroborate and follow up on the initial investigation, to go back to the site and say, you know, now that you mention it, we're hearing from the defense that you may not have been under 15 at the time. For the prosecution to go back and do that, it's a diplomatic mission, in essence. They can't simply fly back and check out in quite the same way. Um, I think I'll stop there. There are a lot of very important issues as a legal matter about what it means to use a child as a soldier. There are very important issues with regard to reparations about the dual status of child soldiers. They're both perpetrators and victims. And what's left for, say, the children who never took up arms but lost their families? Are they going to be included in reparations? Um, but I think I'll leave that for questions and just suggest that going forward, 
what we might want to look at is a much broader view of all the ways that children are both in and affected by combat um, and look to prosecutions um, that tell that larger story and don't zero in exclusively on the child soldiers. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Come on, folks. Is in there something about Southern hospitality? <laughs> morning, Charles. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Um, I'd like to uh, start by uh, acknowledging the hard work uh, done by the uh, editors of the Law Review who put together this fantastic uh, symposium and for honoring me uh, with an invitation to be uh, part of this uh, rather august uh, gathering. Uh, of course, the panel uh, that I am on is supposed to be about the Thomas Lubanga trial, uh, but I'm coming in at the end because I understood my brief today uh, to be the guy who would come in and tell the bad story. This is a bad story about the tension and the relationship between Africa and the International Criminal Court. Uh, but I'm not proposing to actually take up that challenge this morning. Uh, rather, what I would propose to do is to look at it from the point of view of the new opportunity uh, that I think that has been created with the assumption of an African prosecutor uh, to reset, recalibrate that GPS. Uh, so in the next uh, 10 or so minutes, uh, what I will do is try to tease out what admittedly are preliminary views as to how we can reset uh, that relationship. Uh, my prior scholarship uh, has tried to expose the tension and to look at what I consider to be legal uh, reasons or political reasons that are coming into the mix and affecting the relationship between the court and Africa. And I have an article, uh, if you would allow me uh, some self-advertising here, that looked at that issue in detail. Uh, but in that article, and the reason why I mention it is not just so much to advertise my work, is to actually point to uh, a number of changes that are happening at the institution itself uh, that might create the space uh, for us to have a new conversation as to how we can enhance the relationship between the court and Africa. And the reason why I'm mentioning that specifically is because I uncovered that a lot of the African concern about the International Criminal Court could actually be put at the door of one organ of the tribunal, and that is the office of the prosecutor. Now, that should not, in principle, be surprising to anyone, because, of course, the prosecutor is really the immediate face of the court. This is the person that we see as an international personality out there. But more fundamentally, within the framework of the court, this is the person who has a responsibility um, under the appropriate provisions to investigate and once they determine that it is appropriate to bring a case to initiate the judicial process. So in, in some respect it's not surprising at all that the anger that at one point the AU had would be directed specifically uh, to the office of the prosecutor, which gives me an opportunity to then make the argument which I propose to make here today, and it will be interesting to see what your reactions to this is, which is that now that we have a new prosecutor, uh, at one point it's clearly it got very personal between Ocampo uh, uh, and the AU, to the point that they even had decisions saying some not so nice things about him in a, in a public, uh, public uh, document. Um, so now we have a new prosecutor. I'm proposing that that new prosecutor, because she happens to be African and happens to have been supported by African states to that position through an African Union decision that endorsed her candidature, might actually play a constructive role in recalibrating that GPS. So effectively, we've had about 10 years of difficult travel in my mind and so that GPS is kind of okay well we are here now finally and here in terms of the Lubanga trial and the Gujolo trials uh, we see some results so we've arrived in a sense at one destination one big milestone uh, for the court completed trial one conviction one acquittal for the reasons that Diane and, and my uh, good friend Noah have mentioned Okay, so what about re recalibrating the GPS and resetting it using uh, this new opportunity? So what I propose to do next little bit is talk about the opportunities that I see in the first part of my remarks, about three to four main points there. And in the second part of my remarks, to so pull out the challenges that I see to those opportunities. So in a sense, I have to do both because, of course, to be realistic, I want to consider the other side of the argument as well. 
So let's look at the opportunities. The first point is there is something going on with the legal position of the court, and this is something that I had flagged as an issue in the early days of the conversation about the relationship. And this is a lack of clarity as to a significant doctrine as the doctrine of immunity, which of course, for those of you who might have been following this story, played right into the debate as to whether the ICC is targeting Africa or not. Of course, by way of background, you're aware that it was the Security Council that sent uh, Sudan by way of referral to the court, and as a subsequent step, uh, it was a prosecutor who determined that there was a reasonable basis to believe that crimes had been committed in Sudan and sought an arrest warrant, an indictment for the sitting president, Omar al-Bashir of Sudan. Now, what is interesting about that is that it drew a big legal debate that I think to some extent remains unresolved, at least if you listen to some academics, um, in terms of the relationship between two nicely uh, uh, written provisions that to some extent reflected some tension. One is Article 27, which basically says that the fact that you're head of state doesn't matter, we can prosecute you in this international tribunal here. We have jurisdiction over you. That is not an unusual provision. You can find the same provision in the statute of the ICTY. We heard a lot about the ICTY this morning. This uh, ICTR, this is the Rwanda Tribunal, Special Court for Sierra Leone. It goes, in fact, all the way back to Nuremberg. So nothing really surprising there. But then there is this other nice little provision in Article 98 that basically says that the court, in a sense, cannot put a state in a situation where they might be violating their international law, customary international law obligations that they owe to another state. So we have a situation where the African argument about the Bashir situation reflects on one, to one degree the issue as to the the, the concern that the ICC might be jeopardizing the AU efforts to make peace in the Sudan. But there is a legal argument that the AU states are making as well, which is an important argument, which is, according to them, that they do not have an obligation to render as a, 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 the head of state of a non-party state to the court. For the longest time, academics are trying to grapple with this, and some people were writing about it. And one of the concerns that was expressed was that the court itself did not say anything about this in a clear way in the arrest warrant decision. But since then, we've had a number of decisions that have been issued by the court basically saying, look, you have an obligation to turn over to the court any individual that is subject to an arrest warrant validly issued. So you are violating your international law obligations, your obligations in particular under the Rome Statute, if you do not turn the person over. So now, that decision is a welcome step in clarifying what is the official position of the chambers and the judges and the court itself with respect to that debate, notwithstanding Article 98, okay, basically the court is saying. Now, there's been some criticism of this decision. I think some of it is merited. It could have been a stronger decision. For example, Professor Akande uh, from Oxford has written quite a bit about this issue, and he's been following this story from the early days, and it was one of those early scholars who got onto the issue and expressed regret that the court did not deal with the question in a central way. So now, in a sense, I'm saying we have an answer. Now, the AU, of course, has reacted to this and issued their own interpretation, their own understanding of the legal provision. So in a sense, there's a legal back and forth that's going on. But in my mind, for the purposes of the arrest warrant, we have a situation at the court now where it's clear what the obligation is as interpreted by the court. So we have a clear position compared to a situation where some years ago one could argue with a great degree of credibility that there is some ambiguity in the law. Now, having gotten that decision, in my mind, that is a great segue for us to be able to expose the African governments to the argument that now, if you want to cooperate with the court, you must assist in arresting and transferring this individual uh, who is subject to the arrest warrant so he could come to the court and answer the charges against him. So I think that's a big legal development that create, creates an opportunity to reset, to recalibrate that GPS. That's the first argument. My second argument in terms of opportunity is that we see some changes that are happening with respect to the court itself. And that is, the court realizes as soon as it has made that decision that you have an obligation to cooperate, 
We obviously have a head of state who is traveling throughout the continent, willy-nilly going to summits, pretty much invited to everything but one or two meetings. They've got into this situation where there will be a request for a country basically to explain as a party why it is hosting somebody who is subject to an indictment by the court. And in the Malawi uh, and Chad decisions, basically the court said, look, you cannot do this. You have an obligation to render a fugitive to the court, and we understand that he's traveling to your country. Why are you doing that? Of course, you can ask whether this is a smart strategy, because of course you could see a state maybe calling the court bluff. But what is interesting, and rather than calling the court bluff, they've actually come to the court to engage the court and give legal arguments as to why they feel that they should not be asked to do this. So again, the upshot of all of that, if you go to the next step of that conversation, is that we now have a scenario where the court is constantly monitoring, basically, where this individual who is alleged to have committed international crimes traveling to next and calling on that country to cooperate with the court, almost like a naming and a shaming game. What is, of course, disheartening is that we do not have the Security Council stepping up the Security Council being the one that referred the situation to the court in the first place, to at least perhaps issue a Chapter 7 decision that will make it mandatory, not just on Sudan, which is what it did in the uh, referral uh, resolution, but for all states to cooperate with the court, including perhaps specifically mentioning the arrest and surrender of an individual, no matter who he happens to be. So I'm seeing this practice of the court as a second opportunity to recalibrate that GPS. Now I have to, I have a few other points and I'm looking at the time here, so I might have to race through some of the other points. The third point, and this is very, very important, uh, has to do with institutional changes in terms of the leadership. At the ICC, of course, we are focused on the ICC. I'm talking a lot about the ICC and the new prosecutor. But also, there are changes happening at the AU side. So the AU ch uh, commission chair has changed. The most vociferous critic of the ICC in the last little while had been the previous commissioner, uh, Jean Ping. Now we have a different kind of commissioner, and the sensitivity seems to have declined, I think partly because of the internal politics of the organization, and partly because of the personality from South Africa who has assumed that position. Okay, so this is the new chair, and I think that creates space for a new conversation because you no longer have, if you will, Ocampo on the one side, and then, uh, uh, on Ping on the other, kind of making it very personal. You have two different personalities that, in my view, offer an opportunity for us to reset that GPS. And both, of course, are women. There's a very significant point as well. This is, this is a huge development in terms of uh, uh, gender equality at the international level, especially when it comes to these sensitive positions. There is another change happening at the sub-regional level, the regional level, and the country level. At the country level, we see new countries coming to the table. They were previously very hesitant about the, the engagement in international criminal justice. Tunisia, from North Africa, became the first country to actually ratify the Rome Statute. Egypt, during the course of the Arab Spring, indicated that it would be interested in ratifying the Rome Statute as well. And there are some questions about where that commitment is now especially because I think recently the foreign ministry issued a statement saying they are also at the same time of ratifying the ICC stat uh, statute would uh, probably um, uh, also sign an Article 98 agreement uh, with Sudan. It's a whole other uh, legal question. And a number of other points that fall in in terms of changes that are happening uh, in terms of Libya's own specific role at the AU, a big sponsor, this direct personal interest that Gaddafi had, who of course uh, has, uh, is now uh, passed away, as you all know, and so on. Changes that are happening at the level of Rwanda, these are all countries that are known parties to the court that were really doing a lot of damage uh, to a good relationship between the court and African states. I don't have much time left, so let me go to my challenges very quickly, and I'll pick up just on two points, if you permit me, and hopefully the rest of the points would come up uh, in the context of the conversation. The first thing in recalibrating this relationship, in my mind, requires that we support the court, that African states support the court to implement the unenforced arrest warrants. The Malawi decision is a significant step in that regard, but more fundamentally, I think that the new prosecutor should seize the momentum 
and try to build that conversation with African states, not so much in a public space, but privately. Obviously, you know, taking her role as an independent prosecutor very seriously, and I have no doubt that she has that integrity and that credibility, but also using the soft factors that she has now in terms of the AU almost unanimous support for her uh, candidature to that position. To then say, here's what I need you to do. I need you to enforce this arrest warrant. So that is a significant challenge for the prosecutor, a significant challenge for the court, and she must take the lead in that regard. Other countries are obviously supporting the court. The United States has included the ICC in its uh, justice for rewards, uh, rewards, sorry, rewards for justice program uh, with the new legislation that was passed, including the ICC in that conversation. This is where they will basically pay money out to individuals who have information that leads to potentially the arrest of an individual. That's a significant step, obviously, in the context of U.S. shifting its position of opposition to the court. Um, there needs to be a liaison office in Addis between the court uh, to enable that relationship. There has been a request on the, uh, to the AU for a long time. They were favorable to the request initially, but because of the tension in the relationship, they kind of put everything on hold. But again, I think as part of resetting the relationship, Fatou Ben Siddak with credibility can say to the African states, we need to have the liaison office here so we can talk to each other, not at each other. I think that would be a significant step forward in resetting that relationship. And finally, let me just add one more point, because there was a, a, a good discussion between the AU in 2007 and 2008, between the AU and the ICC, to have some type of MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, relationship agreement. The ICC has concluded these types of agreements with other regional bodies. They have done so, for example, with the EU, and of course clearly have one with the uh, United Nations. But the talks stalled. And again, as part of recalibrating this new relationship, I think we need to reopen that conversation to talk about, in particular, how AU states that are willing and supportive of the court could help the court enforce, especially, these unenforced arrest warrants. I'll leave it at that. I don't want to abuse my privileges. Hopefully, we'll get an opportunity to pick up on some of the finer points in the Q&A. Thank you very much. We've got very short time here, and I would love to ask you about a number of things, but perhaps if, as the chair, I could go ahead and prompt one discussion between um, Diane and Noah. You both mentioned this tension between narrow charges and broad charges, and I think Diane looked your direction, Noah, and said, I don't know why they didn't charge more broadly, uh, but just focused on a narrow massacre, and I don't know if you can comment on that, but would love to hear it. I think it might be an example of the tension that you have in the court with uh, narrow charges versus broader charges. You know? um, okay, maybe I can explain Morano Campo's reasoning uh, charging um, only the child soldiers uh, uh, war crimes charge. Coming in as prosecutor of the ICC, he was very concerned about the efficiency of the court. So the ICTY had been criticized for being inefficient, for taking a long time, for costing too much money. The ICTR, the Rwanda Tribunal, same thing. So Moreno Ocampo met with management consultants from um, the Harvard Business School and designed a special type of office that would be more like a design studio than a bureaucracy. Um, uh, and his idea for the first case was to make it quick, efficient, Hannah Arendt style, kind of justice and justice alone. What did the definition of the charges say? What are the elements of the crime? We're going to get this guy out of the bush. He had Al Capone in mind, Morneau Campo, and he often cited this as his example. You want Al Capone off the street? You can't get him for all the different crimes. You get him for tax evasion. So that was the original justification for the narrow charges of the child soldiers case. And he thought that all the discussions surrounding it by what he called the International Justice Network, the reporters, the students, the professors, the NGOs, would fill in the historical uh, blanks that he'd been left uh, by the other things. Um, so he filed narrow charges. But as we saw, because of the way the trial played out and that a lot of these rules were being worked out because it was the first case at the ICC uh, and the procedures were being worked out too, Things took super long and it got overinflated while still leaving out uh, the sex crimes charges, which had resulted in an internal debate where many of the investigators while I was working there resigned.
because they had put their witnesses in great danger. They put themselves in great danger to collect that information. They brought it back to The Hague, and Moreno Campo said, I'm sorry, guys, we're not going to use that. Yes, go ahead. There's a real tension here. I think um, at first blush, it feels like the idea to zero in on something and tell the story very intensively um, seemed to make a lot of sense back in the mid-2000s when, the, when this was announced. And as Noah said, as a practical process matter, it didn't work very well. But it turns out there, there are two other issues at hand, at least. And perhaps the most important one is the issue of reparations. And I think this hadn't been thought through. Um, in addition to victim participation being a novelty in the ICC statute, the idea that the criminal court uh, will, after, after conviction and sentencing, um, award reparations based on the crime of conviction was utterly new and unthought through. What it's work, first of all, because of the fact now the events occurred in 2003, we're now in 2013, everything's going to be appealed. If reparations are ever awarded, infants who were born during the conflict will have reached the age of majority by the time that the reparations are done. So that's bizarre in and of itself. But beyond that, the trial chamber in Lubanga established a but-for test for reparations. That you have to show that but for the crime of conviction, you would not have suffered in the conflict. Does that mean that if you can't prove it was a child soldier who killed your father, you can't claim reparations? That's one interpretation, which is utterly bizarre. Um, it's unclear at all why one single individual's conduct of conviction should be the basis for reparations. From a restorative justice standpoint, the fact of conviction is virtually irrelevant. Um, and so it, it, it's one of those things that maybe in the next ICC review conference, they'll start thinking through that problem a little bit. Let me just go back really quickly to something that Charles said. Um, I, I really hear, as you describe this tension in the African Union about whether or not now it's mandatory to turn over somebody that comes and visits another African country, uh, a political another story that's told that scares away the United States from ever being part of the, uh, the ICC because now we're going to be ordered by some court to turn over somebody who we don't want to turn over. And maybe as a little bit of a, of a segue also into our next panel after the, after the break, um, we can start to think about this tension between peacemaking and, the, and the, um, in some ways the open possibility that individual countries can uh, be a place of escape, be a place of uh, perhaps uh, of uh, sanctuary for an individual to get them out of the, the playing field, um, and that that option is being lost as we move much more toward a rule of law. And I wonder if you have some hesitancy about whether or not it moves more traditionally into a court that has all this authority and what room that uh, plays with uh, making peace on the ground. Um, very quickly, I mean, that's a huge question. Um, that has been, I think that is one of the biggest debates now as to the link between peace and justice. And if we saw anything in Sudan is that the AU concern was actually predicated um, on the fact that they had been the countries that put together the peacekeeping forces, put boots on the ground in Sudan, and we're trying to make peace out of the longest running conflict on the continent. I mean, that should not be minimized. That is a genuine concern by any state right, to put boots on the ground, and then all of a sudden, you have a new entrant into the picture. So in a sense, international justice is coexisting with a very uh, difficult problem. You have an ICC coming in, in in the course of an ongoing conflict, not where the conflict had ended with the, you know, some winners and losers and so on. The conflict is actually ongoing, giving credence to those who would argue that you've got to be very careful in the way you use a prosecutorial mechanism in, in that. And of course, there's a nice uh, little discussion as to what the ICC has within the, its own provisions that might allow 
if you will, an escape hatch, right? This is so-called Article 53, interest of justice provision. And of course, the OTP, the Office of the Prosecutor, has taken one interpretation of that, which is basically, look, we understand that to be uh, the uh, interest of victims only. So if you have problems that may be more of a political nature, why don't you go to the Security Council? And this is the mechanism that allows, for example, the Council to decide under Article 16 that it could defer a situation for one year, and that, of course, is subject to renewal if the Council feels so. Right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting debate, and it's, I think part of the solution ought to be, uh, maybe in resetting this, uh, uh, this relationship, uh, that, as I was arguing earlier, uh, for the OTP to revisit its position on the interest of justice. And of course, I have to admit here uh, that there are scholars lined up on both sides of the argument in the sense saying, yes, the OTP has it right, but then you have other people who are quite weighty also on the other side. For example, Professor Shabas, who is very, very adamant that no, the OTP has it wrong and is a big authority in this area. So maybe as part of finding a solution, we need to look at that aspect in the sense of within the court. But just one last point in terms of the political side, at the Security Council, the Security Council also has to help the ICC, because what we see now is uh, the Security Council sending the court when it seems convenient, and then when the court has an arrest warrant that is unable to enforce, comes back and reports to the council, and they say, thank you, Madam Prosecutor, we'll see you next year. Well, why don't you do something, right? Why don't you maybe issue a resolution that calls on countries and mandates uh, the countries to render the person over? Because you can perfectly do that within the framework of the Charter. Maybe the solution at the political level, in other words, might also be the international community working together to find a solution through the Security Council. I know we're, we're very tight on the time. Is it, we've got time for a question, if anybody has one, from the audience? If not, I'll respond to um, yeah. Charles if there's okay. no question. Yeah. I think that one th Moreno Campo has been criticized like crazy. But one of the things that he had right, I think, was the peace versus justice dilemma. There's no question in my mind that he had it right. If you look at the situation in Sudan, the same people that were being negotiated with were the ones perpetrating the atrocities in Darfur and elsewhere. And then as soon as that negotiation continued, it allowed them to just shift positions. So the man who was in charge of the genocide, Ahmed Haroun, was then made to be in charge of the camps where the people fleeing the genocide were supposed to be placed and committing crimes there as well. So unless you get these guys out of the negotiating process, then what you get is a continuation of this violence over and over, and it just keeps going. And the International Criminal Court's job is to change that so that we no longer have these continuations on the pretext that we're making political bargains with people that are committing atrocities, but rather we arrest them and get them off the street. So I think his hard line uh, was correct and he should be remembered, uh, not just for his difficult managerial style, uh, but for the boldness of his vision and for his claim that the political decisions of withdrawing the ICC from cases where there's a sensitive negotiation uh, that are going on should be left to the Security Council and the court's job is to prosecute. All right. Well, thank you very much to the panelists here this morning. I think it was a wonderful discussion. Let's give them a hand.